Saint Peter Regalado, confessor, first order. The life of this great servant of God appeared to be merely the unfolding of an even stronger exemplification of the virtues which he received in holy baptism. Born in 1390 of wealthy and devout parents at Valladolid in Spain, he lost his father in an early age, but he himself became the comfort of his pious mother, who with joy and gratitude to God recognized in her little son distinct signs of future holiness. One could notice nothing childish in him. He loved places of retirement where he would sit for hours in deepest devotion. Not only did the saintly child meditate upon the sufferings of Christ, but he wished also to share in them by inflicting pain on his tender body. When he was 10, he importuned his mother to permit him to consecrate himself entirely to God in the Franciscan order. The prudent woman first tried his vocation for a long time, but after three years, she could no longer doubt that the call came from God. She gave her consent despite his youthful age. At 13, and the 13-year-old Peter was also granted admittance into the convent, a thing frequently done in those days. Although he was a child, he practiced all the austerities and virtues of a perfect religious. Just at that time, when there was being introduced into Spain a stricter observance of the rule, and Peter attached himself to it with lively zeal. From Valado Valladolid, he traveled with his teacher and his superior, Father Peter of Villagarcia, to the quiet little convent of Aguilar in the Diocese of Osma, where he prepared himself for the priesthood by earnest study and still more earnest prayer. He had, he had been a priest but a short time when his teacher, who had sent out, set out on a journey to establish new convents of this reform movement, believed that he could find no one in Aguilar better fitted for the superiorship than his pupil, pupil Peter Regalado. In this position, he proved himself so efficient that after the death of Father Peter in the year 14 of Villagracia in the year 1442, he was appointed head of all the convents of the movement in Spain. Where whatever he as superior taught the brethren, they saw his observance more perfectly in his own life. He kept, he kept almost continuous silence the greater part of the night he devoted to prayer. Holy Mass he celebrated with such devotion that he often, he was not able to refrain from tears. He scourged his body sometimes even until it bled. His bed was the bare floor and a little straw. Nine years, nine times a year, he kept a 40-day fast, mostly on bread and water. Religious, religious poverty he observed most rigorously, for which reason he had to suffer much opposition and even persecution. He accepted that, however, in patience and meekness out of love for God. His love of neighbor was so great that he often brought the poor and the sick with him into the convent and cared for them with great love. God rewarded his faithful servants for a service with the most extraordinary graces. At prayer, he was so filled with seraphic ardor that he was seen raised above the ground with flames radiating from his body. On occasion, there occurred a, pro a prodigy such as was once observed in the life of our Holy Father, St. Francis. The flames rose above the full roof of the convent, though not damaging it. The Bishop of Osma, who once saw this prodigy himself, cried out, Truly this is the abode of God. It seemed that the body of the holy man possessed the agility and ease which our glorified bodies will once have, because he crossed over rivers as though they were solid ground. And often he, found at this, he was found at the same hour at convents far distant from one another transacting business pertaining to his office. God Almighty announced the praises of his servant through the months, the mouths of babes. On one occasion, Peter said to a babe in the arms of his mother, May the Lord bless you, my dear child, and what a beautiful and brilliant soul you have. At this, the babe turned to him and said to the amazement of its mother, But still more beautiful is your soul, which God has adorned with so many graces. Soon, however, the great mass of people was to praise him. Peter died in the 66th year of his life, on March 31st, 1456, and immediately the veneration of the people began. His grave was glorified by innumerable miracles. Pope Benedict XI beatified him. Pope Benedict XIV solemnly enrolled him among the saints. Concerning the praises of men, one fault-finding is a great vice, 
But one must be on guard also in regard to the praise of men. Very seldom is their praise infused by God, as was that which the babe spoke concerning St. Peter. Most often it is a snap judgment about some striking deed, or it is the promising beginning of a thing which they praise. There is a wise saying which says, One should not praise the day before evening has come. But still worse is the praise of those flattery and deceitful tongues which praise even the bad in others only in order to be pleasing to to them. Woe to you, says the prophet, that call evil good and good evil. Isaiah 5.20 Do you too have reason to fear this woe? 2. Consider how dangerous the praise of men is for the one in whom whose favor it is spoken. Encouraging recognition where it is deserved has, of course, its place and time. But just as many sweets are harmful to the body of a child, so does much praise do considerable harm to the soul. And is it not necessary even in later years and in old age to fear such harm? Censure is bitter at times, nevertheless it is a medicine, but praise which goes down like sweet honey is apt to be a terrible poison. It makes us proud and arrogant. The Holy Ghost says, As silver is tried in the refining pot, so a man is tried by him that praises. Proverbs twenty-seven twenty-one. Genuine virtue remains serene and indifferent over it, whereas sh- sham virtue becomes inflated. How do you accept the praise of men? Have you performed, have you perhaps allowed yourself to be confirmed in evil through flattery praise? Three, consider what should determine us to be indifferent to the praise or blame of men. You are not more holy for being praised, nor the worse for being blamed, says Thomas Akempis. What you are, you, that you are, nor can you be said to be greater than God sees you to be. Great tranquility of heart has he who cares neither for praise nor blame. He who walks uprightly before God and aims to act only in accordance with his good pleasure will, like St. Peter, be made known when the Lord will make manifest the counsels of hearts. Quote, Then shall every man have praise from God. 1 Corinthians 4, 5. Prayer of the Church. O God, who has graciously admitted Blessed Peter, your well-beloved servant, to partake in the delights of your glory, we beg you to grant to us, through his merits and intercession, the grace to lead a mortified life after his example, so that one day we may come to eternal happiness through Christ our Lord. Amen. St. Peter Regalado, pray for us.